We are coming this morning, as I think you probably may recall, maybe not, I don't know how much attention we pay to these things, but uh, this morning we're coming to the life and thought of Martin Luther. Um, and so I want to spend a couple of days on him at least, probably not a whole lot more than that. When we think of Martin Luther, of course, we think of the Reformation, and usually Martin Luther is regarded as the great, humanly speaking at least, kind of cause, the, the human um, precipitant, if you will, of the Reformation, but then it's always uh, at least useful, I think, to notice there were some so-called pre-Reformation reformers, people who came along who tried to do something like Luther, but usually uh, met with a violent end before they were able to actually get the job done. Some people have said the only reason Martin Luther was successful was because he had the political protection of Frederick Elector of Saxony, who kept Luther safe when the Catholic Church was out for his head, you know. And so uh, Luther, if he'd been executed when he was 26 years old, probably would not be a name we are all talking about today. But uh, it was the fact that he was able to live to the ripe old age of about 50 that he uh, was able to be as important as he was. Who are some of the other pre-Reformation reformers? Who else makes the short list of people prior to Martin Luther who were doing some of the same things, arguing for some of the same uh, ideas, but who just for whatever reasons were not able to get traction? And some of the names that would make that list would be? Ben? Is it Erasmus? Uh, Erasmus would not be. He never broke with the Catholic Church. He was, a, he was a, certainly a Renaissance guy. And some people would say he was a reformer, but he's not arguing for a theological reform in the church. You know, he's, he's sort of out there in the middle. It's a good thought. Uh, he's also a contemporary. I'm thinking of people who are prior to Luther. Uh, Megan? John Huss is... Huss would him. certainly be one, yeah, John Huss. You'll sometimes see it spelled uh, with two S's. That's kind of an English spelling. It's actually more correctly spelled with one and more correctly pronounced Hoos. John Hoos, whose name actually means in Bohemian goose. Hoos the goose. Did we talk about that in this class? Did I mention that to you? And when he was being burned at the stake at the Council of Constance, he said, you can cook this goose but after me will come an eagle that will not be so easily stopped. And most people take that as a little prophetic anticipation of Luther. So uh, uh, it's a great last line, isn't it? <laughs> you know? um, who else? Who else would be pre-Reformation reformers? John Huss would certainly be one. Another one. These are names you know, I think. Uh, Wycliffe, for sure. Another John. Again, you'll see various spellings. Many times it's spelled with two Fs. Wycliffe Bible translators, for example, spells it with two Fs. Most think the more correct spelling is with one F, Wycliffe. Uh, who's he? Anybody know his story at all? Short version of his story, John Wycliffe? No? You've heard of him? Anything? No? Trivia at all? Go ahead. English reformer that did some, he translated the Bible. That's right, that's right. So, uh, Wycliffe uh, translates the Bible into English. This is in the late 1300s. So he's quite, he's early. So Huss is 1400s. Wycliffe is actually the 1300s. He argues for justification by faith alone. And other rather Lutheran ideas, you know. He's not uh, executed, but he is exiled. He gets into a lot of trouble, and so he's sort of neutralized by the church in England. This is before, of course, Henry VIII and all of that. And, uh, but he does translate the Bible into English, and that's why the Wycliffe Bible translators took him as their kind of namesake and uh, carry on their enterprises in his name. There's one other that you may or may not know the name of this guy. Yes. 
a trend of John's. Is John Knox? No, John Knox is late. Just throwing that out. Yeah, John Knox is actually uh, late 1600, well, no, not late, late 1500, so it's after that. The trend of John's is almost, go ahead, yeah. Tyndale is, uh, you could put him on the list, yeah. He's another translator. Um, I'm not going, going to include him, but, but you're right, he could. We could put him on there. That's a good thought. There's one other. He's connected with Josiah. Uh, Zwingli? Not Zwingli. He's later. Okay, then, I don't know if you know this name. Do you know the name Savonarola? Do you know that name? Okay, William with a G, and I, I can sometimes spell the last name. S-A-V-O-N-A-R-O-L-A. -A -A. Savonarola. I remember it because it alternates. A-O-A-O-A. A-O-A-O-A. -A -A -A. Anybody know anything about him, Savonarola? Anybody? Jacob, ever heard of him? Never heard of him? Joe? Savonarola? Anybody? Laura? Isn't he the one that burned things in Florence? Uh, well, he may have burned some things, yeah. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. He, he was, uh, that's good, you're right. He's in Florence. He is a Catholic priest. He's a powerful critic of the very corrupt Catholic Church of his days, contemporary of uh, Luther, but, but, you know, Luther's born in 1483, Savonarola dies in about 1498 or something, so, you know, he's uh, an older guy at that point. Uh, he's not so much a theological reformer, but a moral reformer. He just launches these huge diatribes against the corrupt, uh, the, the Medici family in particular in Florence, and their corrupt popes, and all of the priestly class that were just uh, so ghastly in the way that they just completely abused the papacy and the powers of the church and so on to their own uh, personal ends and their own personal enjoyment. It was uh, Pope Leo X, who was a Medici, who said, God has given us the papacy, and let's enjoy it, you know, kind of deal. And they had a big party and just, that was it. That was the kind of religious life they lived. Savonarola w went after that, you know, with uh, a great deal of vigor. All of these people were calling for reform of the church. None of them succeeded until you get this monk in Germany. And you have to keep in mind, Germany is like the backwoods. From the point of view of Rome, you couldn't get much more rural and much more backwards and uncivilized. I mean, they kind of pictured Germans, Germans as people that sat down and ate raw meat around, you know, Camp. I mean, they just, they had no, no time for the Germans. Uh, these people were considered nothing much more than barbarians out there from the point of view of the elite Roman culture. And so to hear that there was a monk out in Germany making up, who cares, you know, monk in Germany, big deal. That was kind of their attitude toward him. And so uh, in any event, uh, uh, that monk in Germany uh, is still some of we talk about. So anyway, Martin Luther, born 1483 in Eiselben, E-I-S-L-E-B-E-N, Germany, of a peasant family. Now, peasant sometimes means to people poor, and often that's what it meant, but this is more a social class. It simply means that Luther was not born into a noble family, but it wasn't an impoverished family. So Luther's father, whose name was, anybody know the father of Martin Luther, his name was? Have you ever covered this? You must know the story of Martin Luther from somewhere along the line. Anybody? Okay, father of Martin Luther is Hans. Hans Luther? Yeah. Well, his dad wanted him to be a lawyer. I think yes, he did, so. that's right. Yeah, so I think he was going to, but on the way walking home, there was a lightning storm. That's right. And he promised Mary that if she saved him, then he would be a monk. All right, you're close. Most of the pieces are there. Uh, you're way ahead of my story, though. 
you know. All I want to know is that that is the, uh, the name of the father, but you're right, that's fundamentally correct. Uh, so anyway, uh, Martin is uh, born of the family. Hans is his father. Hans is a miner, that is to say, he owns a mine, a coal mine, and he makes uh, money. He's not a miner, as in a child, you know, but he's a miner, uh, as in a guy that... Uh, so he'd actually established a certain degree of family wealth as a result of his good investments and hard work and so on. Uh, he realized immediately, well not immediately, but pretty soon, that his son Martin was, was quite precocious, very brilliant, and he thought to himself, ah, here is my social security program, you know. <laughs> Because uh, in those days, if you had a brilliant child and if you spent the money to educate them well, then the child could become either clergy uh, in the upper echelons of the church or maybe a lawyer or otherwise uh, find himself in some profession where, of course, you make fabulous money. You know, all lawyers, you know, make fabulous money. And so, uh, and so uh, don't believe that, by the way. Don't believe that. Just, uh, but anyway, uh, he sends him off to grammar school in 1497, so he's uh, in his mid-teens. He does very well, so well in fact, that at the age of 17 he's enrolled at the University of Erfurt, E-R-F-U-R-T. So 1501, at the age of 17, Luther enters the University of Erfurt. While he was there, he saw for the first time in his life a complete volume of the Bible. He'd never seen one before. He'd heard of it. He'd grown up a good Catholic. Chained to the wall in the library was this big volume, Latin volume, of course, of the Bible. And he recalls, well before the Reformation, but he recalls later in his memoirs how he would sit for hours and just read that Latin Bible. He'd never read it before. He was astonished at the stuff that was in there, you know. He'd never heard of it. And so that was uh, quite a experience for him. He graduated in 1502, second in his class. He was the salutatorian. I point that out because sometimes we in America have this funny feeling that if we're not first, we don't count, you know. Uh, if you're not number one, then you're nothing. And I just want you to know, Martin Luther graduated from college number two. Number two, and I don't know who number one was. And I don't think history cares who number one was, because number two was the guy who changed history. So if you graduate number two or number 20 in this class, not to worry, you see. It's still well within God's providence to use you, and don't get so hung up about being numero uno. That doesn't uh, necessarily mean much. Yes, Stephen. So he only spent a year in college? Yeah, right. But the educational system, uh, Stephen, good question. The educational system then was such that um, uh, it, it, the most you would normally spend in college at that point would be a couple of years. You know, it's just it, it's it's like um, a graduate degree based on education he already had. But he was accelerating. He was going faster than the average for sure. So in 1502, he has his bachelor's degree. Uh, he went on to graduate school in 1505. He graduated with a degree in law. So he indeed was trained as a lawyer. Just exactly what his father had wanted for him. And he was on his way back to school. After visiting home, they had a big celebration and everybody was excited and good boy. Marty, you're doing great, you know. And it's the dawning of a new day and everything's fine. He's writing back uh, to the university to, to wrap up some things. And as uh, Megan was mentioning to us a moment ago, he was going along actually on horseback and he was riding through a thunderstorm. Now this is the late Middle Ages. And even though Martin Luther is a well-educated man, he still shares the superstitious outlook of his day 
And one of the superstitions commonly entertained at the time was thunderstorms meant that God was being a little grumpy, you know, and that sometimes if you were caught in a thunderstorm, that might indicate that God was angry with you. And all of a sudden, so Luther's already feeling a little bit anxious about uh, the situation, and all of a sudden, as he's riding along, he almost gets hit by lightning. Very famous incident, one of the most famous incidents in church history, when Luther almost got struck by lightning. It hit about maybe, you know, 20, 30 feet from him. If you've ever been close to a lightning strike, you know it is a, it does get your attention, you know. <laughs> you do know something has happened. And uh, he was thrown from his horse, his horse, and he fell down into the mud, the rain. And in that uh, moment of panic, he cries out not to, not to Mary, but he cries out to Saint Anne. And his famous little prayer at that point, very short, help me Saint Anne, I will become a monk. One of the most famous prayers ever uttered. And two weeks later, he became a monk. And his daddy was not happy. Because monks in those days were just a little bit below used car salesmen in the <laughs> respect that they were given uh, in the community. You know. uh, monks were not known for their um, wealth. You know, They weren't known for their I mean, basically, even though it's an odd thing, I think for us it's sometimes hard to imagine, but the popular mood of the day was, if you were a monk, you were connected with the church, they had great respect for the church, but a lot of disdain for monks, because monks had become by that time little more than public beggars. But they were beggars that nevertheless held themselves out as religious characters. So they kind of played the guilt card with you. You know, help the Lord's work. You know, kind of deal. You know, come on, man, get away from it. Won't you vote for the Lord's work? Oh, I'm crying out loud. Okay, here, you know, kind of deal. So a lot of grudging donations to these monks because that's basically, you know, what they were. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, Hans was not happy at all. He thought this was the, a great waste of a great education, a waste of a lot of money that Hans himself had spent to get Luther educated, was now going down the tubes, and so much for the Social Security program, it was over, and Hans was just furious, and almost disowned his son at that point. But Luther felt uh, absolutely bound uh, to join the monastery because he was so guilt-ridden. He'd always been a little neurotic. And this is true of geniuses. You know, that's why I'm so relaxed. <laughs> Nothing bothers me, you know. But people that are really, really smart, they constantly know how much trouble they're in, you know. Uh, Pascal, who's reporting on Pascal? He's a great example of a guy who was just tied up in knots with his neurosis because people who are very bright know all the threats to their well-being that are constantly. And if they're very bright, like Pascal, they can actually compute the statistical probabilities of any of those of perils befalling them in any given moment. And they're just constantly riddled with these feelings of, uh, and, and in the case of Luther, it was very much that way. Uh, and so he entered the monastery partly because he thought God was so angry with him. The lightning bolt was just, you know, God missed the first time and the second one was on the way. And so Luther thought that uh, this was the only way that he could escape God's wrath. And he entered in and very famously, he became one of the most ferocious, zealous, monks uh, ever to live. He did all the stuff we associate with asceticism. He would whip himself. He would uh, uh, sleep in an icy cold, you know, kind of uh, cubicle. He was just punishing himself, doing everything he possibly could to try to alleviate his anxieties and his feelings of, um, of guilt. He, uh, he talks later in table talk especially about how when he was in the monastery, he would confess his sins literally for hours a day. You know, go to the confessional booth, you know. Usually, I mean, a monk goes to the confessional booth once a day. And you think about it. How many sins can you commit in a monastery? I mean, really, you know. 
So, most of these guys would go into the confessional and they'd confess their sins for maybe five, or if they were really super zealous, maybe up to ten minutes of the sins they'd committed in the last day in the monastery. Yeah. Luther would go into the confessional booth and he would confess his sins literally for two or three hours. You know, like they listen to him in shifts. You know, it's like, oh, the pizza. Here comes Brother Martin. It's your turn today. You know, and they, these guys would be sitting there falling off to sleep while Martin is going through these agonizing self, you know, exploration. He was like a Freud before Freud. He's searching out all of the strange little odd, you know, sinister motives that are there inside his soul. And he would confess them in excruciating detail, every one of them. And then he would just wait for that one great moment when, after confessing his sins, the priest would say, okay, Luther, te absolvo, you know, I forgive you. And for one moment, sweet relief, he felt forgiven. He, he would almost wish he could die in that moment, in that little nanosecond that he felt innocent. But then he'd walk out of the confessional booth, and by the time he walked five feet down the hall, his mind had already thought an evil thought. He wanted to run right back in, you see, to the confessional and say, oh, one more thing, you know. And, no, you have to wait till tomorrow, Martin, you know. And so uh, it was I like that. He was, uh, it was awful. But anyway, that was uh, the life he lived uh, as a monk. Nevertheless, he was very productive. He was ordained as a priest in 1507. He had a very traumatic experience the first time he celebrated the Mass. He almost froze, almost panicked, could hardly make it through because he believed he was actually holding the real, you know, body and blood of Christ. And he was panic-stricken that he was going to screw up, frankly. I just, you know, this was it. And he was so, he, he actually froze in the middle of celebrating the Mass and stood there like for five minutes just paralyzed. People were kind of whispering, you know, and everything. What's going on? And uh, he finally made it through, but not, uh, not in very good style. In 1508, he was, however, offered a job at a brand new university in the little town of Wittenberg. Wittenberg. Which had been established by a guy whose name was Fred. Freddy? He went on to establish a department store chain later. You wondered where that came from, didn't you? Duke Frederick. I don't think it was spelled originally with a K, but you can spell it the way you want. Duke Frederick, who was called Elector of Saxony. Saxony was a German province. The major province, province, provinces in Germany had electors. There were seven of them altogether and they would elect the next emperor who became the Holy Roman Emperor. And so he was a duke, meaning he was over this region called Saxony, and he was an elector, which means, therefore, he was one of the more prestigious uh, dukes, you know. And uh, so anyway, he had a fair amount of political clout, and he was starting this university, and he wanted some bright young scholars to come and become his original faculty, and Luther was hired for the job, and so in 1508, he goes off to Wittenberg. And he does very well. He's a good lecturer, popular, uh, even though he still feels completely riddled with his own self-doubt and anxiety. In 1510, he had an opportunity to go to Rome. So this is like going to the big city. It reminds me of me when I was in law school, uh, had the opportunity to go to New York. Uh, I, I and a friend of mine had competed successfully in a thing called moot court, and we'd won the, the uh, local competition, we'd won the regional, we were actually going to go to New York to compete at the national level in a moot court competition in a uh, actual, like, uh, appellate court setting there, downtown Manhattan. You talk about a kid from the sticks, you know. Uh, I mean, I was just going, whoa, whoa, look at those buildings, you know. I mean, yeah, this, my friend came out and, Gore, would you please <laughs> Oh, but it was, uh, it was quite, a, uh, quite an experience. 
if you're curious, by the way, we, um, we took second. Wow. We took second. That's right, I know it. We beat Yale, but we lost to Georgetown in the final round. So, you know, there you are. What's that? Good Zaga. Yeah. Right. Zags, go Zags. They're all in the back. Go Zags. <laughs> but well, we're on a digression. How about the Seahawks? Whoa. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> no, dream on, pal. I will make that bet with you. <laughs> I'll give you a 10 to 1 on that one. <laughs> all right. So, anyway, back to uh, the story. Luther, uh, the kid from the sticks, goes to Rome. Luther, of course, is uh, pretty excited because he, as you know, from Germany, this sort of backwoods, uh, thought he was going to the center of the universe. He thought he was going to the place where the holiness of you know, the, the city and the history of it, it was the city of the martyrs, it was the city of the Pope, it was the city of the Vatican, it was the city of all of these things that he associated with kind of the heart of the presence of God. You know, this was like a pilgrimage for Luther. He was going to the holy place and he thought this was going to be the life transforming moment for him when finally all would become clear and all of the kind of anxieties that he had felt would be removed because he'd be there in this great place of worship. And so he was brutally disappointed when he showed up in Rome and found this late kind of renaissance uh, just dive, really. You know, all of the, the uh, clergy were corrupt. The Pope's illegitimate kids were running around the Vatican. I mean, literally, I'm not making this up. Uh, you know, the whole place was just horrible. This was the Pope who had said, God gave us the papacy, let's enjoy it. That's the Pope, you know, that Luther was exposed to at that point, and they were enjoying it, and Luther was just appalled at the corruption, the, the slick professionalism of it, the, the hypocrisy. It was worse than anything he could ever have imagined was anything Jesus had dealt with in Jerusalem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all that. It was exactly the same, only he thought worse, you know, just that kind of superficial religious practice that didn't have any heart whatsoever. It was just people kind of living this high life on the shirt tails of God's people. So he was extremely, um, you know, disillusioned and disenchanted. If you ever saw the movie Luther, that wasn't bad, it was a few years ago, and he's climbing up these steps, they show that scene, and it kind of hits him like an epiphany. He described something like that. He was actually going up these steps, kissing each one of them. That was one of the regimens you would do, uh, going up to some kind of shrine there. And as about halfway up, he goes, what is up with this? You know, he just sees all of it, and he just kind of in a moment realizes how empty it all really was. So uh, he returns home. Many people think the Reformation really started then. That was the point where it hit him, that something is wrong. You know? and so. Uh, he goes back to Germany, a somewhat changed man, uh, but nevertheless continues his labors in the Catholic Church. Um, he gets his doctorate in theology in 1512. His first published work was called Historical and Chronological Context. Oh no, a different published work. His first published work was called Commentary on the Psalms. That was in 1513. And the really life-changing moment occurred for him in 1515 when he was working on a commentary on Romans. And I would very much like to tell you about that, but we need to interrupt this rehearsal of the life of Luther because... All right, so 1515, Luther is working on his commentary on the book of Romans. He gets to a troubling text, he cannot quite fathom it. It is Romans chapter, does anybody know? Have you ever covered this? Anybody know this? What verse in Romans just 
stops him cold. He's working his way along and he cannot get past this verse. He can't figure it out. And it is, anybody know? Okay, it's Romans, no, this Romans chapter 1, verses uh, 15 and 16. And 17, that little text. It is uh, the text that says, uh, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because in it, the what? Does anybody know? Anybody know what it goes? I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because in it, ba 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 wah, 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 what? What comes next? What's next? Anybody know? No fair cheating. Okay. Yeah. All right, here it is. I'm not a, go ahead. You want to rig it? Oh, it's already gone. I, I told her not to cheat, and I was going to invite her. Here it is. Here's how it goes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because in it, Paul says, the righteousness of God is revealed. Yeah. Uh, now, he actually says that it's the power of God unto salvation, so on. But the critical line that God Luther stumped was, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. And Luther could not understand why in the world Paul would regard it as good news to hear that righteousness from God is being revealed. Luther would much have preferred to hear, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because in it the righteousness of God is concealed. Because for Luther, when righteousness is revealed, all that can mean is that my sin is being more fully exposed, and that can't be good. You know. I don't know if you've ever had an experience like I did when I was a little boy. I was a little, you know, six-year-old reprobate, and my mother had made cookies. They may have been brownies, actually. I think they may have been, but anyway, some kind of little morsels, and they were in the kitchen. And I was not supposed to sneak into the kitchen in the middle of the night and eat <laughs> any of those cookies, you know? That was not what I was supposed to do. And so you probably know how the story goes. Middle of the night, I think I'm being so, you know, how quiet can a six-year-old kid be? Look at these guys, they're back, you know? And uh, so how, uh, how quiet can a six-year-old be, you know? I. I uh, crawl out of bed and I go tiptoeing down the hall into the kitchen. I'm just gonna, just gonna grab one or two little cookies out of the cookie jar. No problemo. <laughs> Nobody will know, you know. And so, so what? I re pull off the lid, reach in, reach down, and do you know what happened right as I'm grabbing the cookie? Mouse trap. No, not a mouse trap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good grief. My mother is that. <laughs> Snap! Whoa! <laughs> that would be cruel. <laughs> no, the lights come on. You know? There I am. I mean, you talk about getting caught red-handed. That's about as red-handed as you can be, you know? And I just, I was terrified, and rightly so. Well, that's, that's what Luther thought of the phrase, the righteousness of God is revealed. You see, when the lights come on in the kitchen and your hand is in the cookie jar, that is what it means to say, righteousness is revealed. And for Luther, anytime the lights come on, you're always caught with your hand in the cookie jar. You're always guilty. And so Luther couldn't imagine why Paul would say, oddly enough, I'm not ashamed for, for Luther that was the moment of the most acute shame. You see, that was when the lights come on. That's the most embarrassing moment. What does Paul mean, I'm not ashamed, because righteousness is revealed? If, right, if the lights go out, fine, I get it. If righteousness is concealed, good, I'm okay. But for the lights to be dazzling hot, beaming on me, exposing me, the very core of my corruption, and then say I'm not ashamed, Paul, you know, Luther just couldn't make heads or tails out of it. And he wrestled with that, and he talks about later how it just sort of hit him one day like an epiphany, uh, that what Paul is talking about there 
and this is the way he puts it, he says, it's not that righteousness with which God is inherently righteous, but it is the righteousness that God gives as a gift. Or what you have learned, hopefully, you recall last year from doctrine, is called imputed righteousness. It's righteousness given as a gift. It's a secret student we have, and it sneaks in here occasionally. I sometimes think it's Mr. Williams who's developed a cloaking device, you know, and he just kind of <laughs> comes in. But uh, anyway, and that uh, Luther says of that, that, that he, his description of it is wonderful. He says, he felt like at that moment, the gates of paradise opened and he walked in. It's a wonderful text in Luther's writing. And I would say it's probably the moment where we would say, from our perspective, Luther really came to faith, really. You know, that, that was the moment where he somehow got it and trusted that and his life changed. That was in 1515. Same year, Pope Leo, our good friend, decided he wanted to spiffy up St. Peter's. But of course, to do that, to hire the great talents that were available in those days, Michelangelo, Raphael, you know, others, it took money. Even the Pope has to pay these guys to come and do their labor, so he needed money and a lot of it to rebuild St. Peter's, the place that you all saw this last summer. Oddly, ironically, the construction that you all walked through, St. Peter's Basilica, all that wonderful artwork, that particular construction was the chief cause of the Protestant Reformation. Always makes me happy when I walk in there and look, I am a result of this great construction, you know? <laughs> it gave birth to me, a Protestant. And so, uh, but anyway, uh, Pope Leo commissioned the completion of St. Peter's by, uh, he had a little fundraising plan. You know, sometimes popes would have bake sales, they have other little fundraising uh, programs, but in the case of Pope Leo, he decided to, instead of selling cookies or donuts, he thought he'd sell what? Indulgences, yeah, indulgences. And of course, indulgences are nice. <laughs> Haven't changed a bit, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So uh, anyway, there's, uh, if we had more time, I'd read some of the um, literature connected with that. But basically, the commissioning document that gave instruction to the indulgent salesman was that these indulgences were pretty high powered uh, and that you could buy a lot of cool stuff with, by purchasing an indulgence. Stephen? Why are they called indulgences? Mm. Because it's an indulgence for, for sin or for guilt. You know, to indulge someone means to put up with their wrongdoing. Like I'm indulging with Jonathan there. He's running around the room, he's making problems, you know. But I'm indulging, he's what? He's a graduate, you have to treat him nice at this point. You know, so anyway, you know, that's an indulge, so that's kind of the idea. So anyway, um, the uh, indulgences that could be purchased, uh, one of the things the Pope says in this is, one thing you can purchase is the complete forgiveness of all your sins. That'd be cool. Pay a little money. I have to leave you with this thought, but I just want you to ask yourself the question. If you really believe that there is heaven and you really believe that there is hell, and you really believe that you are on your way to hell and it'll be a place of unspeakable, incalculable anguish forever, you really believe that, and you really believe that if you can just scrape together a certain amount of money and go buy something that you can escape it. How hard, if you really believe that, do you suppose you would work to scrape together that money to escape that destiny? Now, I don't know about you, but if I believed all of that, I would spend every waking moment of every day doing everything I could to scrape together whatever amount of money 
was required. And that's what the Pope was basically saying. Buy this thing and you pay for your sins. You, you pay for your forgiveness. And uh, so they went out selling them, and of course Martin Luther heard about it and became somewhat mm, disturbed, would be the word. But we'll have to pick that up uh, tomorrow, so we'll wait until then.